Good evening. Thank you for your presence here this evening. We appreciate seeing each and every one of you out for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Thank you for being here. If you're a guest of ours, we are extremely grateful to have you in our midst here at Midway. We're going to go ahead and get started. What we're going to do is we'll let Ed Griffith come up and lead us in our opening prayer. Then after Ed uh, opens up the service with the prayer, then we'll turn it over to Ronnie to sing a song. And then at the appropriate time, Mark will extend the invitation of our Lord. So at this time, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful unto thee for blessings in our life, and especially the blessing that we can meet together and fellowship together and study your word. Help us to always be mindful that we need to study each and every day, not just when we attend your service. We're thankful for all the opportunities that come our way. We're thankful when we stand in those long lines with the opportunity to learn to be patient and humble. Help us to always be mindful of these things. We thank you for your love for us, and we praise the, your great and holy name. We realize that your ways are higher than our ways. And help us to refrain from trying to do your work in a way that would be overpowering what you tell us to do. Help us to always be mindful that you're in charge, that you watch over us, and you'll take care of us if we read and study and prepare ourselves to be in your fold. We're thankful for all the material blessings you send our way, for the rain, the sunshine, the air that we believe, we breathe, and all the things that we face each day. If we would just stop and look, and we'd realize that all of them come from you. We're thankful for the love that you have for us, but especially the love you had that was so great that you sent your son here on this earth, that he lived and showed us a way that we could at least strive to be perfect. We're thankful that the word that he left for us to study, and we're thankful most of all, that he gave his life for each of us. That he did this so that we'd have forgiveness of our sin. So that all the work that we do, all the study that we do, and all the good things that we do in the life, and all the things that come our way that we try to be a better, better person, all these things he provided for us to try to live the Christian life so that we can have that home with you in heaven because he gave that perfect life as the eternal gift. And we pray that if it be thy will that you forgive us of our sins, help us to overcome these weaknesses in our life Help us to be strong and always try to be on guard when things come our way that tend to tempt us into doing those things that we should not. Help us to be love, love, to love each other, to be kind to one another, especially in the church, in the fold, in the Christian fellowship that we have. We pray that you'll give us the courage to face the devil and the things that he sends our way. Help us to be strong that we might discern the truth and not let him lead us down the path that would cause us to sin. Help us to be strong so that we can avoid any temptation he sends our way. We pray for the leaders of the church and the work they do. And someday each of us needs to stop and look and listen and observe 
all the work that's done here at the church in this building, around the building, and all the people that are involved in doing those things that has to be done to keep the maintenance of the church, the things that we do, the classes, the teaching, the preaching, the singing, the praying, all of these things has to be done by other people. Other people being us as Christians. That everybody has a job and we need to realize this. We pray for those that have a tendency to miss classes. Though that those that miss the classes that are set up after everything else, help them to realize that they can't just continue to go home. That we have to do what you have set aside for us to do, for the elders to direct us. That we should be present each and every time that we have a, a function here at this church. Because it's part of what we have to do as a Christian, what we must do as a Christian, and how much we must love to do these things. Be with us as we continue on in these classes. We pray for those that are teaching, that they may have the knowledge, that they've studied and prepared themselves. And us as listeners, Help us to realize the work it goes into studying and preparing to teach a class. It's not that you can just get up here and teach a class. It takes a lot of study, a lot of time, a lot of reading, a lot of meditation. And help us to pray for each one of those that teach. For they truly need all the prayers that we can give. Be with us as we continue on this service. Help us to put aside the things of the world and fully concentrate on what's happening and what's said. For this we ask and give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder As of about 4.30 this afternoon, the headline on Fox News said, Hurricane Ian makes a landfall in southwest, southwestern Florida. More than one million without power. Now we understand and we know what power means there. We're talking about electricity, don't we? And, and when we think about that and being out of electricity, we know that it is really a great inconvenience to us sometimes. It is devastating, and there are times when being without electricity is even deadly. 
And so we understand, you know, that there is a problem when there's no power, when there's no electricity. But this evening, I want you to think about a different power. I want you to think about what is said in the book of Psalm 62 at verse number 11. In that passage, the psalmist says, I've heard it once and I've heard it twice, and I'm paraphrasing that part. But I want you to listen to the last part of that. That power belongs to God. Power belongs to God. Now we could, we could speak for an entire hour tonight in talking about the power of God and showing His omnipotence and all of those things. But I want to focus on one thing tonight. I want to focus on the fact that we are weak. We understand that. We know that from passages such as the one we find in the book of Romans chapter 5 at verse number 6. For while we were yet weak, the, when we were yet weak, the Lord came and died for us. That is, we were without strength. We were without power. We were feeble, as it were. But the Lord came and died for us in that situation. But then we turn to passages such as the one in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and in verse number 18. And the Apostle Paul again mentions the power of God. And he talks about those who are perishing and he says, to them the cross is foolishness. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And then we could go to the book of Romans chapter 1 at verse 16 where Paul wrote and said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now understand tonight that with those people who are in Florida, the problem is most likely not the source of power. It, the the, the Electrical plants are probably still up and going. They're generating. But you see, they have become disconnected from the source of power. And so many in our world today are disconnected from the source of the power of their salvation. So many today are out there and they have no connection to God. We need to have a connection to God if we want that saving power that God offers us. And we have that connection by putting on our Lord in baptism according to the book of Galatians chapter 3 at verse number 27. As many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And you know what? We maintain that connection by walking in the light and doing that which is right. And when we do that, the blood of Jesus Christ, our connection back to God, continues to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our world is filled with people who are without power tonight. It's our job to seek to find them, to bring them to the power so that they can have the salvation that God offers. But it may be tonight that one or more in this audience needs to be baptized, to plug in, if you will, to the power of God, the power of the blood of Jesus that can cleanse your sins. It may be tonight that there's someone who has stepped out of the light and they need to come back to the Lord. And it may be that they need to do that in a public way. If that is the case, if we can assist you in any way tonight, why not come as together?
Okay, we are in the book of Acts, chapter number 7. We're down at about verse number 16. We're in the section that begins, if you will, in verse number 9, goes down through verse 16. And so what I want to do, we talked about the majority of it last week, but what I want to do is go back and read verses 9 through 16, and then pick up in 16 and talk a little bit more about some of the things that we really need to discuss there. Verse number 9 says, And the patriarchs, that's Joseph's brothers, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him out of all of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan, a great affliction, and our fathers could, not find, or could find no food. And when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob his father, and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem, and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. Now, all of us understand, we know the story back from the book of Genesis. And last week we talked about when Stephen is recounting this story, it seems uh, on first sight, I might say, that there may be some mistakes that Stephen makes. But when we look at it and we think about it, Stephen is speaking, as we've noted and we've talked about, by what? He's speaking by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so we would expect there would be no mistakes in what Stephen has to say. And even though, as we talked about last week, when there is a difference between our English translations of what is said in the book of Genesis about the number of people, 70, and what Joseph says about it being 75, here in the book of Acts chapter 7, there is an explanation very likely what, Joseph, or what uh, Stephen is doing is quoting from the, which translation? King James? No, he was quoting from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. And it seems that that was a pretty reliable source to be used because as we mentioned last week, about how many percent of the quotations that Jesus makes is made from the Septuagint? Around 90% of the quotations that Jesus makes from the Old Testament are taken from the translation that we know as the Septuagint, that LXX, if you ever see that. And so we have a divine um, a signal, if you will, that translations are reliable. Uh, some are not. Some are not word-for-word -word translations. It's not our purpose to talk about that tonight. But that does explain what is said. And we noted last week that since uh, such things as the, uh, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls have been found and some ancient Hebrew manuscripts have been uncovered, that they too say 75, and they explain that back in the book of Genesis. And so it may well have been that the manuscript that was used to translate our Bible into English, used by the King James translators, had a copyist uh, mistake. God inspired the writers, but He didn't inspire those who were copying it down after it had already been written. And so we, we dealt with all of that last week. And so even though people will say, well, there's a contradiction, we'd handle that one. But then we come to another part, especially in verses 15 and 16, that people who uh, want to find a, a problem with the Bible, they'll look at it and they'll say, uh-huh, uh-huh, there's a contradiction right there. And if you can't trust that, then you can't trust any of it. And so we have to deal with that, don't we? And what we're about to talk about, we're going to spend some time on tonight, what we're going to deal with is because of the fact that people make those charges against the Bible, we who are faithful Christians need to know how to explain what is said. We need to know, is it right? Are they right? Which one is right? They can't both be right. It can't be a contradiction and not a contradiction. 
because if it's a contradiction, you know, it means that something is off. And if something's off in the Word of God, in the Bible, then we're not going to have problems with the rest of it. And so we need to we <coughs> study through <coughs> some of these things and deal with them and be able to handle them. Now, are you familiar with the next contradiction that some would uh, point out that's found? Let me back up again to verse number 15. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a psalm of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. Now all of us probably should remember that when the Israelites left the Egyptian captivity, there were a lot of things that took place after the, after the plagues and Pharaoh finally relented and said, get them out of here. They were able to obtain some great wealth. They, they did that. But they also remembered that they needed to take some things other than, than, than worldly things with them. And so if you remember <coughs> they did carry with them the bones of Joseph. Joseph had made them promise that when uh, they left Egypt, he said, the Lord's going to redeem you, and when you go out, take my bones with you. Well, that's what we're reading about here in this passage, verses 15 and 16. We're reading about that event. We're talking about that thing. But now, as they carried them out, we know according to the book of Genesis chapter 50, verses 25 and 26, what I just said, that he had made them promise. And then we go to the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, in chapter 13 at verse number 19, and there we find these words. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones uh, with you from here. So far so good, right? Everything sounds good. But what about the part, back here in verse 15, when Jacob went down to Egypt and he died, he and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem and buried in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver. Is there anything wrong with that? Okay. It says it here. So we can we can generally we can generally take it for granted that that's true. But we're, there's more to it than that. Who who is mentioned here as being a part of what some take to be they? Jacob died, and then the others died. But Jacob wasn't carried to Shechem. And he wasn't carried when they left Egypt, was he? Matter of fact, when we go to the, again, back to the book of Genesis, we understand, we know that uh, when... Uh, when Jacob died, what happened? When he died. At the point that he died, what happened? Do you remember? Going, going back to the book of Genesis chapter 50. Look at verses 12 through 14. Genesis chapter 50 verses 12 through 14. All right, the text says, Thus his sons did for him, speaking about Jacob in the context there, Thus his sons did for him as he had commanded them, for his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Now which one is right? 
is Moses right or is Stephen right? The thing about it is what we need to understand is we don't need to make the text say what it does not say. The text tells us that Jacob went to Egypt, right? Would you agree with me? Jacob went down to Egypt. And what happened to Jacob while he was in Egypt? He died, okay? Now, did he die before his sons or after his sons, as we just read? Well, he died before his sons because his sons take him back and bury him, right? But then, not only do we find him being dying in Egypt, it says, he and our fathers. And they were taken back to Shechem. There's no reason, even though the, the critics claim a contradiction, there's no reason that we don't separate Jacob from his sons. I, I mean, we know, we just read that they carried him back and buried him in Canaan at Hebron rather than at Shechem. Well, we didn't actually read that. That's in chapter uh, 23, verse number 19. That, Shech, that the cave of Machpelah is in Hebron. But to, to make the text say that, well, he died and his sons died and they all were carried is not necessarily in the text. Matter of fact, if we were to look at some other translations, we'd see that they translate it differently. Translate it more like the, the, the original Greek text. He died and... His sons also died while they were in Egypt. Didn't die at the same time. And, and when he says, and they, after if we make a distinction between Jacob dying and his sons dying, and they being buried, knowing what we know about Jacob already having been dead and carried back to Canaan, we don't have to make it say that he was carried back with them. Uh, how many, did, he, did Jacob have more than one son? Yeah. And when we look at, is that plural? And so when the fathers, which is plural, died, the fathers were taken back with the children of Israel when they left. Jacob died and the fathers also died. Like he died, they died. That's the, that's the force of the text. Like he died, they died. All of them died in Egypt. But like he died, they died in Egypt too. And when the children of Israel left, they took the bones with them. They took the bones with them. And so the point is we don't need to make the text say more than what it actually says. But that's not the biggest problem with what the text says. When we look at where they buried Joseph and very likely his brothers. Matter of fact, if you read uh, historical sources such as Josephus, there was, a, there was a, not a legend, I wouldn't say that, but a tradition that uh, in Shechem, all of the, those patriarchs, those fathers, that they were all buried there. But I want you to look closely at what the text says. They were carried back to Shechem and buried where? And buried where? In a piece of land, or no, rather, they were buried in a tomb that Abraham had bought. Huh. Interesting. Let's go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 33. And let's read verses 18 and 19 first. Genesis 33, verses 18 and 19. And where did Abraham, according to Stephen, get this tomb? Here in Acts. From the sons of Hamor. 
Okay? Now, what do we find in the book of Genesis 33, verse 18? Somebody, won't let somebody else read that one for us tonight. Who's got it? Aram. Okay. He, 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 he did what? Who did what? Who bought something? Let me put it that way. Jacob bought it? Abraham bought it, didn't he? Well, let's go to Joshua 24, 32. Joshua 24, verse 32. Okay, who's got that one? Is this a contradiction? As biblical critics charge? Stephen said Abraham bought the tomb, and the Old Testament said Jacob bought the land. Uh huh, there it is. He made a mistake. If you can't trust that, you can't trust any of it. So, how do we explain it? Is it really a contradiction? Well, let me throw something out for you. It, the, a thing can only be a contradiction if there's no other explanation for it. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, when you think about it, Kyle Buck gives a good illustration. I had not read this until I was studying from, uh, for this lesson, but it, he gives an illustration about a guy who's being questioned by FBI agents. He's been taken in, he's a suspect in some kind of crime, and so he's being... He's being uh, questioned by these FBI agents, and so they ask him, says, where were you on the night of October the 31st of 2000? Where were you? Okay, so if you've watched any of these, uh, these crime shows on television, you can just imagine that the guy's sitting there, where were you on this night? And the guy says, well, I've already told you I was at a Halloween party with my friends, Okay. And so you know that they're not going to let it go. They're going to keep hammering at him. And so they ask him again, you know, well, just what were you doing at that Halloween party with your friends? And he said, I was bobbing for apples. Okay. They leave him alone for a while. And a few hours later, another FBI agent comes in. And he comes up with a question. He says, sir, have you ever bobbed for apples? And the guy replies, he said, no, sir, I have never in my lifetime bobbed for apples. Now, what do we have? He either bobbed for apples or he has never bobbed for apples. It can't be both ways. What had the guy done? He had contradicted himself, right? You can't harmonize that. It's either you do or you don't. You have or you haven't, okay? So that's a contradiction. But if there is an explanation, a plausible explanation, that can be rendered for it, then it's not necessarily a, a contradiction, right? Now let's take it for an example. And I'm not saying that this is the case. I, I, I'm just using this to ask if it's plausible for something to happen, okay? Is it possible that Abraham bought a piece of land in Shechem, some property in Shechem. Is it possible that that land was sold? Uh, by the way, do you know every business deal that Abraham ever made? Do you? 
I don't, I don't know, but just a few business deals that he ever made were not actually told. Okay? And the Bible doesn't necessarily tell us about him going down in the Old Testament, going to Shechem. We do know that he was in Shechem. But it doesn't tell us about a business deal he made about him buying a tomb in Shechem. Okay? doesn't say anything about that. But let's just suppose that he did. Approximately how long was it from the time that Abraham was in Shechem until the time that Jacob was in Shechem? Two months, three months, a year, ten years, 150 years? I would jump to the 150. So from the time that Abraham was there until the time that Jacob was there, approximately 150 years had elapsed. Hard for us to imagine that. We got a grandfather, a father, and a grandson. And between the grandson and the grandfather, we've got 150 years. Okay, It's hard for us to imagine that because we just don't live that long. Right? But in those days they did. They lived a long time, didn't they? Abraham didn't have his first son until he, or his, his son that was supposed to be his heir until he was how old? Oh, he's getting pretty old to start with there, isn't he? Then, then uh, Isaac's got to grow up and all of those kinds of things. Do you suppose in 150 years that that property could have changed hands again? And if so, when Shechem, uh, when Shechem, when Jacob went to Shechem, some 150 years later, purchased the same piece of land that Abraham had bought. Is that possible? Mike, have you ever sold, I don't know, have you ever sold a piece of land to a grandson that had belonged to a grandfather? My grandfather bought some land on the Sipsi River, and I'm working on buying it. From my mother, uh, I'm paying her for it. So in essence, what have I done? My grandfather bought it, and now I'm in the process of buying it. Is that a plausible explanation? Could that be what happened? I, again, I am not saying that's what happened. I'm just saying, is it possible for that to happen? And if it's possible for it to happen then we don't necessarily have a contradiction, do we? Nope. Because of a possibility of an explanation that is sound and, 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 and good. Okay? But think about this. I think in probably the way that we should understand it is best shown in another land purchase that Abraham made. I said I didn't know, but just a few. Let's go back to the book of Genesis 23. <clears throat> Genesis 23. And I want to read 20 verses. I know that's a long reading tonight, but I want to read all 20 verses. And I want you to pay close attention. I want you to have your Bible open, and I want you to pay close, close attention to what is said, okay? The Bible says, beginning in verse number 1, Genesis 23, Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah, to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I'm a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Uh, isn't that a natural thing? One of the things that you need to do when someone passes away is to, if you haven't already done it, to secure a place to bury the person. Abraham's doing exactly what we would do. He goes to the people who have some property, he goes to the Hittites. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my Lord, you're a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Just use our graveyard. 
It's not going to cost you anything. We'd be honored if you would bury your wife in our graveyard. Okay? That's basically what they're saying. All right? And, and, and so they say that. They make that statement. Abraham's not content with that. He said to them, if you're... Uh, now let's go back. Verse 7, Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. And he said to them, If you're willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It's at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. Now pay attention to what is said. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites, of all who went in at the city gate, No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that's in it. In the sight of the sons of the people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land. And he said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, But if you will hear me, I will give you the price of the field. Accept it from me, that I may bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, My Lord, listen to me, a piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What's that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out to Eph for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights and uh, current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron and Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field and the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field, Throughout all its whole area was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place for the Hittites. Now you listen to me read that, and I emphasized a few things as I was going through it, and I hope you picked up on it. What was Abraham wanting to buy? A burying place. Where was he wanting to bury Sarah, his wife? And where did he actually, according to the passage, where did he actually bury Sarah, his wife? In the cave of Machpelah. But did you notice that when he is negotiating, I guess you might say, with Ephron, that he made an offer to Ephron, and what was his offer? Go back to uh, uh, verse number 9 and find the offer that he made. He said the cave is at the end of the field, and then what does he say? For the full price. Now, the full price of what? When Ephron and Abraham were negotiating, what did Ephron say the cave was worth? He didn't say what the cave was worth, did he? But when they were negotiating, what did he say was worth 400 shekels of silver? The field. He said, what is the field that's worth 400 shekels of... What's that between you and me? Just bury your dead. Go out there and put her in the cave. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to be unsympathetic, but he's saying, just do it. But the Bible says Abraham was listening to him, and when he listened to him, ah, Ephron had done thrown out a price that Abraham says, I'm going to pay full price. So what is he paying for? He's paying 400 shekels of silver for 
the field and the cave. Do you notice they keep being separated in the text? He bought the field. He got the cave. What else did he get? He got the timber too. Okay? He even got the timber on there. But notice how it's separated out. He only wanted to bury Sarah in the cave. But he said, I'll just buy the whole field from you to use as a burial place. And finally they ended up doing that, right? Now we read that so that we can understand, I think, what happens and what we see here in the book of Acts. When you look at the book of Acts, well, first of all, let's go back to Genesis 33, verse 19. Genesis 33, 19. We've already, we've already noted this passage, but I want to go back there for a minute. And I want you, when you're looking at it, to tell me what Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver. What did Jacob buy for a hundred pieces of silver? He bought a field, didn't he? He bought some land. If you go to the book of Joshua 24, verse 32... What did he buy for a hundred pieces of silver? A hundred pieces of money. In the piece of land, the field, that Jacob bought from the sons. Now go back to Acts 7 verse 16. What did Abraham buy? What did Stephen, by inspiration, say that Abraham purchased from the sons of Hamor? He bought a tomb. Different word from land, isn't it? Is it possible that there was a cave on the land owned by the sons of Hamor that Abraham purchased for a sum of land? And when Jacob came back through, knowing his grandfather had owned that cave, that burial place, that he camped beside it. And then he purchased the, what does the Old Testament say? The land on which he had pitched his tent. If it separates the cave from the land when Abraham was buying before, why is it not possible for the tomb and the land to be separated here? Does that make sense? And so if Abraham bought the tomb and Jacob bought the land that was around the tomb, don't we have an explanation that is not a contradiction? Absolutely. Can it be both? Can Abraham have bought land and Jacob have bought the same land? Yeah, we said that a minute ago. Could Abraham have bought the tomb and Jacob bought the land? Just as the scriptures state it. And we only learn that if we do what? Read very carefully. I will tell you, the Bible does not contradict itself. And even though many have charged in this place as well as others that there are contradictions that, wow, that just can't be that way. One said one thing, one said the other doesn't mean it's so. doesn't mean that anything is wrong. And we have given two plausible explanations tonight as to how this very thing could take place. 
Again, I ask, do you really? The Bible doesn't, the Old Testament never tells us about Abraham buying that, that plot. We'll just call it that. But again, I ask you the question, do you really think we're privy to all the business dealings of Abraham? What does the Bible say about Abraham and his wealth? It says he was very rich. How do you get very rich? Oh, well, he went out there and he started just picking up stones and found a diamond one day and went and sold that thing, you know. Well, no, he didn't do that. He was a businessman. And he was able to do a lot of things that we're not told. And just because we're not told doesn't mean that he, <clears throat> he didn't do it, right? Uh, are we ever told that Abraham had a wedding? A wedding? Abraham got married. Are we ever told that? No, we're told he had a wife, which implies what? <laughs> they got married. If he got a wife, they got married. And so a lot of times, you see, the Bible doesn't have to spell out things for us. God has just laid it in there so that if we'll search, we'll find. All right, I don't want to start the next, uh, next section. The first bell's already rung, and we've got two minutes left on this one, so we'll pick up in verse number 17. We didn't make much progress tonight, but we talked about a very important section that we as Christians need to understand when somebody makes an accusation against the Word of God. And we need to know it ourselves, because our, we don't want our faith to be rattled. We want to be able to stand firm as well. Let's close with a prayer. Holy and righteous Father in heaven, again we come before your throne. Father, we're so thankful for your word, for your infinite knowledge, for the fact that you've put these things into your word in, in such a small space, Heavenly Father, that if we'll just keep mining, we'll be able to find the things that, that are there and we can know the truth because your word is truth. Father, be with us tonight as we... Uh, are about to depart this place. Help us to share your word with others. Defend your word to others. And Heavenly Father, help us to be strengthened ourselves with your word. Father, be with those who are sick, those who've undergone surgeries. And, and Father, if it's your will, help them to all recover. All of these things we ask in thy son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.